My dear sisters and brothers, in the first seminar, I spoke to you about God's love. His love is eternal, everlasting and covenanted. To experience his love, we have to empty ourselves of all that is not according to his commandments. God wants us to know the depth of his love and as the prophet Hosea tells us, that God wants our love in return. Daily, we make choices and decisions. But there are also some choices that God has made for us, like our parents, our siblings, our gender, color, features, nationality. St. Paul writing, to Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 says that God even chose us before the foundations of the world to be holy and blameless before him and destined us in love to be his very own through Jesus Christ. Hence the choices we make must enhance those made by God so that we will blossom into men and women that he created us to be by impacting the lives of our family and society, and most of all, to be with him for eternity. Adam's and Eve's choice to disobey God, despite being warned that they would die, is our story as well. We can use our God-given free will to obey, or disobey God. When Cain got angry that his offering was not accepted, God said to Cain in Genesis 4 verse 7, if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain did not. So anger led to the murder of Abel. Our emotions, lusts, thoughts, impulses that overpower us and cause us to act wrongly can come from our rebellious human nature. Jeremiah 17 verse 9 reminds us that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately corrupt. Jesus says in Matthew 15, 19 to 20, that out of the heart comes evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, and slander, and these defile a person. Let us focus a little on temptation and sources of temptation. There are three sources of temptation. The world, the flesh, that is self, and the devil. Temptation is not sin. Succumbing to temptation is sin. St. James in chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 says, No one, when tempted, should say, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself tempts no one. But one is tempted by one's own desire being lured and enticed by it. Then desire, when it is conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The wages of sin is death, or the wages of sin is spiritual separation. The letter to the Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 18, gives us great hope. It reminds us that Jesus, who was tempted but remained sinless, is able to help those who are tempted. Remember what St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, God will not let you be tempted beyond your strength, but with the temptation, he will provide a way of escape. Very often, self is our own enemy, not the I in S-I-N. It is right there in the middle of sin. 
And the first letter of John, chapter 2, verse 16, says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. We sin through our senses, our bodily faculties, like sight, hearing, touch, etc. For example, we read in Genesis 3 verses 4 and 5 that Eve heard that she could be like God. That's the pride of life. She saw that the tree was good for food, that is lust of the flesh. It was a delight to her eyes, that is lust of the eyes. Then she took the apple and ate it. Paul writing in Romans chapter 7 verses 15 to 19 says that we do the very thing we do not want to do. Further in Galatians 5 verses 16 to 21, St. Paul exhorts us to live by the Spirit and not to gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. Now the works of the flesh are obvious, fornication, impurities, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like this. I'm warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Sisters and brothers, sin is treated lightly, even downplayed and sometimes justified. We often rationalize sin in our lives by saying, it's my weakness, or I'm made that way, or God will understand. I think we are losing the sense of sin. Pope Pius XII, in his radio message to the U.S. National Catechetical Congress in Boston on October 26, 1946, that is 72 years ago, had said that the sin of the century is the loss of the sense of sin. Pope St. John Paul II underlining these prophetic words had pointed out that the sense of God is closely related to the sense of sin. When the former withers, so does the latter. In other words, a loss of the sense of sin is the loss of a sense of God. In his 1984 apostolic exhortation on reconciliation and penance, Pope St. John Paul II warned that the loss of the sense of sin is a form or consequence of the denial of God, not only in the form of atheism, but also in the form of secularism. I remember reading the Angelus message of Pope John Paul II on March 14, 1982. He had posed the following critical question. Is it not true? that modern man is threatened by an eclipse of conscience, by a deformation of the conscience, by a numbness or deadening of conscience. Further, he said that too many signs indicate that such an eclipse exists in our time. For this reason, conscience to a great extent constitutes the basis of man's interior dignity and at the same time of his relationship to God. When the conscience is weakened, the sense of God is also obscured. And as a result, with the loss of this decisive inner point of reference, the sense of sin is lost. This phenomenon implies a paradox. While the effects of sin abound, like greed, dishonesty, corruption, broken relationships, and exploitation of persons, pornography, and violence, 
the recognition of individual sinfulness has waned, said Pope John Paul II. Hence he appealed to let us boldly announce that indeed we are not sum total of our weaknesses and failures. We are the sum total of the Father's love for us and capable of becoming the image of his son Jesus. St. Paul in Romans chapter 3 verse 23 says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That includes you and me. In humility, we have to accept our own sinfulness before passing judgment on others. Jesus wants us in Matthew 7 verses 3 and 5, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, Let me take the speck out of your eye, while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. Proverbs 24 verse 16 says, For a righteous man falls seven times and rises again, but the wicked are overthrown by calamity. Sisters and brothers, man does not fall into sin all at once. It is a process that he goes through. At every stage or step in the process, he has an opportunity to stop sinning and to return to holy living. Sin enters a person through the five senses. He sees, hears, smells, tastes and feels, which can become the source of his entry into sin. From the Bible, let us see such a process of a person falling into sin. In the second book of Samuel chapter 11, we see how King David step by step falls into a grave sin by committing adultery with Bathsheba. In the first step, David stayed back. If you read verse 1, we know that David stays back in Jerusalem even though it was time for kings to go to war. He sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. David simply shirked his responsibility. Now this can happen in any individual's life. Instead of going to work or even to college, we could just stay back and laze. Now in step number two, David saw. In verse 2, we see David walking about on the roof of the king's house. He saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. An idle mind is a devil's workshop. His eyes wander here and there looking for something new or interesting. When we stay back, say from work or from college, we start taking a walk on the internet, maybe on the TV, reading unnecessary books and so on, looking for something new or interesting. Now let's move to step number three. David inquired. In verse three, we see David inquiring about the woman. He understands that she is the daughter of Eliam and wife of his loyal soldier Uriah. He should have stopped here, but his conscience didn't bother him. For example, when we are on the internet, we are inquisitive and try to check or inquire the sites which we would otherwise not check. Now in step number four, David called for her. In verse four, we see how David calls for Bathsheba and commits adultery with her and sends her back thinking all is over. But Bathsheba becomes pregnant and informs David about it. God arranges it in such a way that the story should continue and David should be convicted of his sin. We may also fall into sin in one way or the other. Now let's see what happens in step number five. 
David tries to hide his sin. In verse 6, we see that David sends word to Joab, the commander of his army, to send Uriah, the soldier. In verse 8, we see David telling Uriah to go and wash his feet. He wanted Uriah to sleep with his wife so that he can escape from his wrongdoing. Sometimes we commit sin and try to hide it from our near and dear ones. We also devise methods by which the sin may fall on others and nobody will know that a sin has been committed. Let's move on to step six. In verse eight, David sends a gift to Uriah to please him and to cover his own sin. Now in step seven, there's a sin over sin. In verse 13, the great king of Israel is going down to the level of an ordinary soldier of his army by eating and drinking with him in order to hide his sin. Likewise, we also commit sin and hide the sin. Now in step number eight, David eliminates proof of sin. In verse 14, David sends a letter to Joab through Uriah, commanding Joab to set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fighting. Ultimately, Uriah dies in the battle. We also sometimes try to eliminate proof of our sins. Now in step nine, if you read verse 25, David matter of factly says that many people die in war and is relieved that his sin is hidden forever. We also feel that now no one can catch us. Now in step number 10, David makes Bathsheba his own wife. Verse 27 tells us that David brought her and made her his wife. David uses his authority to close the chapter of his sin in the sight of others and becomes a good man by marrying the widow of a soldier. Sisters and brothers, nobody is above God's law. Even the person whom God called a person after his own heart. In Samuel 13, 14 and Acts of the Apostles 13, verse 22. Beat Moses, whom God called as the humblest man on earth, or Samson, who was a Nazarite and chosen of God, or David. Everyone is equal under God's law. No one will be excused. Finally, God sends his prophet Nathan to encounter David and tell him about his sin. David acknowledges his sin and God forgives him. We need to remember what Sirach in chapter 23 verse 19 says, the eyes of the Lord are 10,000 times brighter than the sun. They look upon every aspect of human behavior and see into hidden corners. That is a beautiful song called The Slow Fade by Casting Crown in the movie Fireproof. It provides us a cautionary counsel against making the wrong choices. The lyrics are loaded with pertinent words of watchfulness with the chorus summing it with great clarity. It goes something like this. It's a slow fade when you give yourself away. It's a slow fade when black and white have turned to gray. Thoughts invade, choices are made, a price will be paid when you give yourself away. People never crumble in a day. It's a slow fade. It's a slow fade. There's another beautiful poem titled Heaven's Surprise. It tells the story of a man who entered heaven's door. It goes like this. I was shocked, confused, bewildered as I entered heaven's door, not by the beauty of it, nor the lights or its decor, but it was the folks in heaven who made me sputter and gasp. The thieves, the liars, the sinners, the alcoholics and the trash, 
There stood the kid from seventh grade who swiped my lunch money twice. Next to him was my old neighbor who never said anything nice. Herb, who I always thought was rotting away in hell, was sitting pretty on cloud nine, looking incredibly well. I nudged Jesus. What's the deal? I would love to hear your take. How did all the sinners get up here? God must have made a mistake. And why is everyone so quiet, so somber? Give me a clue. Child, he said, they are all in shock. They never thought they would be seeing you. Pope Francis, in his book, The Name of God is Mercy, talks about two types of people. Those who have lost the sense of sin and those who have lost the sense of God's mercy. He cautions both attitudes are harmful because they stop us from encountering the healing grace of God's merciful forgiveness. One of the key messages in the book, The Name of God is Mercy, is there is no sin, there is no habit of sin, there is no relapse into sin that is beyond the mercy of God. Furthermore, Pope Francis warns about the disastrous influence of this loss of the sense of sin in the church. He distinguishes between sinners who retain a deep sense of sin and the corrupt who have lost their sense of sin. He says that the corrupt are those individuals who arrogantly deny or reject their need for repentance and God's forgiveness and who make their sin a habit and way of life. The corrupt mistake their sin for true treasure, justifying themselves and their behavior. They pretend to be Christian, masking their vices with good manners, always managing to keep appearances and leading double lives. Pope Francis gives a shocking example of this. It reminds me, he says, of a story he heard from a person he used to know who was a manager in Argentina. This man had a colleague who seemed to be very committed to Christian life. He recited a rosary, he read spiritual writings and so on. One day the colleague confided in passing as if it were of no consequence that he was having a relationship with his maid. He made it clear that he thought it was something entirely normal. He said that these people, and by that he meant the maids, were there for that too. My friend was shocked, says the Pope. His colleague was practically telling him that he believed in the existence of superior and inferior human beings, with the latter destined to be taken advantage of and used like the maid. I was stunned by that example. Despite all my friend's objections, the colleague remained firm and didn't budge an inch. And he continued to consider himself a good Christian because he prayed, he read spiritual writings every day, and he went to Mass on Sunday. The Pope says this is arrogance. However, even though such individuals have hardened their hearts, Pope Francis doesn't consider the corrupt beyond the mercy of God. Though they are ordinarily immune to contrition and remorse, the Holy Father has observed that God attempts to save them. G.K. Chesterton, a writer, poet, and a lay theologian, was once asked why he became a Catholic, and he replied, to get my sins forgiven. Peter Crift, the well-known writer on theology and apologetics, said that until people perceive the disease that Chesterton perceived, people will not come to the hospital he came to. Or if they come, they will come for the wrong reason, thinking the church as a museum for saints rather than a hospital for sinners. It is a paradox. Sinners think they are saints, 
and saints think they are sinners. Last Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. Father Mike Smith reminds us that the ashes mean I am a sinner. The shape of the cross means I have a savior. Now let us come to the definition of sin according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Paragraph 1849 defines sin as an offense against reason, truth, and right conscience. It is a failure in genuine love for God and neighbor caused by a perverse attachment to certain goods. It wounds the nature of men and injures human solidarity. Sin has also been defined by St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas as an utterance, a deed, or a desire contrary to eternal law. Another definition of sin in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, para 1850, states that sin is an offense against God. Against you, you alone, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. That's what the psalmist says in Psalm 51, verse 4. Sin sets itself against God's love for us and turns our heart away from it. Like the first sin, it is disobedience, a revolt against God. Through the will, do become like God's, knowing and determining good and evil. St. Augustine also defines sin as a love of oneself even to contempt of God. In this proud self-exaltation, sin is diametrically opposed to the obedience of Jesus, which achieves our salvation. Some scripture texts clarify this for us. 1 John 3 and 4 says that sin is lawlessness. It is a deliberate breaking of God's laws and doing what one wants. Rules and laws aim at good order and for one's own good. For example, the school rules, the traffic and government rules. So it is with all God's law. The second verse, Isaiah 53 verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own ways. Now James chapter 4 verse 17 says, Anyone then who knows the right thing to do and fails to do it commits sin. God has blessed everyone with a moral sense of right and wrong, that is our conscience, and feigning ignorance is to justify ourselves. Now Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. This text sums up all definitions given. We turn our back on God and attempt to live our lives independent of Him, not realizing that we are heading for a life of emptiness, pain, shame, and ruin. How does God help us to become aware of sin? Number one, the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 verses 1 to 17. This is an apt checklist. St. Paul says in Romans that through the law comes knowledge of sin. And if it had not been for the law, I should have known no sin. The first three commandments are sins against God and the remaining seven are sins against our neighbor. The second, by applying the word of God to our personal lives, one is bound to get convicted of sin. For example, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you 
that everyone who looks, looks at a woman with lust and has already committed adultery with her in his heart. The third would be through prayer. Isaiah in chapter 6 verse 5 cries, Woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Names of people or situations may come to our mind in prayer, reminding us of broken or strained unholy relationships, gossip, uncharitable thoughts, etc. The fourth way would be by the power of the Holy Spirit. John 16 verse 8 says that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And further, John 14 26 says that the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance all that Jesus said to us. If we are attentive to his voice and attuned to him, he reminds us of all wrongdoing and prompts us what we need to do. The fifth would be through others, even from the mouths of babes. They may confront us with the truth about ourselves, about our bad attitudes, behavior, deeds, hurtful speech. Children are very observant and evaluate us perfectly. My dear sisters and brothers, what are the various categories of sin? First would be the original sin, that of Adam, the effects of which all humanity suffers. It is the basic condition in which we are born, the rebellious human nature which is prone to sin. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, para 4, 102 says, all men are implicated in Adam's sin, as St. Paul affirms, by one man's disobedience, many, that is all men, were made sinners. Sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all men sinned. The Apostle contrasts the universality of sin and death with the universality of salvation in Christ. Then as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one man's act of righteousness leads to acquittal and life for all men. The second category would be sense of commission, what we do, and sense of omission, what we fail to do. The third would be in thought, word, and deed. We are the summation of our thoughts, words, and deeds. As a yardstick, we need to remember the seven capital sins of pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, anger, and sloth. As well as the new social sins, which the church announced during the papacy of Pope Benedict. These are bioethical violations such as birth control, morally dubious experiments such as stem cell research, drug abuse, polluting the environment, contributing to widening divide between the rich and the poor, excessive wealth and creating poverty. Fourth, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1854 to 1863, tells us about the gravity of sin, the mortal and venial sin. Now, mortal sin refers to grievous sin committed with full knowledge and deliberate consent. If unrepented, the Catechism of the Catholic Church warns us that it can cause exclusion from Christ's kingdom and the eternal death of hell. Venial sins are less serious, committed consciously or unconsciously. St. John speaks of both mortal and venial sin in his first letter, chapter 5, verses 16 and 17. Now, what are the consequences of sin? We can see the consequences of sin in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. In verse 8, Adam and Eve 
hid themselves from God. Sin separates us from God. Sin cuts us from God. Now in verse 10, Adam and Eve were afraid. Fear enters human being. Verse 12 and 13, Adam points out at Eve and Eve points out at the serpent. Blame others. Now verse 16, 19a, suffering comes into the world for men and women. Then verse 19b, physical death enters the world. These are the consequences of sin. Now another consequence of sin is spiritual death that Paul speaks in Romans 6 verse 23. We can overcome it by repentance. Remember the words of the father in the parable of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. My son who was dead is alive again. He was lost and is now found. The third consequence of sin is hardness of heart. Sin can grow in us and become a way of life. The sin becomes a habit and this habit becomes an attitude which in turn becomes a way of life and this leads to a hardness of heart. Then the venial to mortal sin, Jesus goes to the root cause of sin and if not dealt with can have serious consequences. We see in Matthew 5 verses 21 to 23 how anger can result in murder. And then in Matthew 5, 27 and 30, we know how looking with lust can result in adultery. The next consequence of sin would be some sicknesses could be psychosomatic. It could be related to sin. We have the story of the paralytics in Matthew chapter 9 and John chapter 5. The sixth consequence of sin would be affliction by Satan. Sin can open the door for Satan to come and hold one in bondage and cause numerous problems. In Luke chapter 13, verses 10 to 16, Jesus tells us the story of a woman whose back was bent for 18 years. Sisters and brothers, Though the consequences of sin is separation, suffering and death, God invites us to remove the obstacles between God and us and be reconciled to him. God will bless us and we shall eat the fruit of the land. God says in Isaiah chapter 1 verses 18 and 19, Come now, let us argue it out, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be like snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. And again, Isaiah 43 verses 18 and 19 tells us to remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. The Lord says, Behold, I am doing a new thing, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? Sisters and brothers, Jesus is our Savior and our Lord. Let us return to him. God bless you.